Welcome to the Practice Podcast, conversations probing the nature of practice. I'm your host, Dave Firon. In this conversation with author Martin Goldberg, we talk about the practice of authoring a book. In this case, it's called Out of the Workplace Trap, a theory in therapy of organizations based on the work of Wilhelm Reich. At the end of our conversation and citing that title, I added based on the work of Wilhelm Reich and Martin Goldberg, because there's a lot of work in this book. And we talk about how that work had to be. It had to be a result of something that had been, as I said, stuck in his craw since he started studying Wilhelm Reich's work and experiencing some of the therapies directly in the 80s, quite a long while ago. So here it is, 2023, and here's the book. I called it, and I still do, a landmark book when I first uh, said hello to Marty again. Marty, you've written a landmark book. Why is it a landmark book? Well, I've been reading, discussing, and doing organization studies and various practices, including management and development and change for a long, long while. And uh, while I can't claim to be the kind of person who's read everything and can remember what I read, I read a lot and I recognize something fresh and something that gets closer to the nub of organization dynamics. And that's this book. And that's the work of Marty Goldberg. So without further ado, here's our conversation. Martin, Marty Goldberg uh, is someone I discovered and I can't remember, Marty, where I tracked you down, but it was probably through LinkedIn. But I was intrigued uh, by the, the focus in in, a, in this book that I have now pretty well read uh, on the work of Wilhelm Reich, which from my standpoint of looking for years at organization theory and theorists and trying to find a new secret sauce, uh, I thought, wow. That in itself is is remarkable because Reich's work, you know, as as you wrote beautifully in the book, has had a, a a lot of ups and downs and rounds and rounds. But when you present it the way you have, it makes great sense from a person who's trying to understand how to help people be an organization. So uh, that's point one. Uh, but point two is that. You, as you know, you're a teacher in Pepperdine University, and you've and you've done a lot of, I'm sure, uh, consulting. But uh, what is the effect on you now that that book is complete? Is it relief? Is it excitement? <laughs> you mentioned just before we started recording that you've got a couple of more book ideas that are in the in the hopper, but what was the effect when that book was done and you could heft it in your hand? Sure, sure. Well, I felt good about it. I mean, it's to be simple that it was uh, said. I mean, I, this began, the, this uh, work began as a graduate uh, uh, level uh, a thesis of mine in Pepperdine's MSFD program, you know, in the late 1980s. Wow. Uh, and uh, uh, and I tell a little bit, describe a little bit about how I came to it, and and uh, we'll, we'll get to that yet. But mm -hmm. but you know, and, and, and David, as as you are an author uh, as well, there is a certain gratification just to have it said, and to have it said in your own voice. And uh, I. And I wrote, you know, and I wrote the book really to get for the uh, to get the ideas out there. It was, uh, you know, as as we'll describe, you know, Reich's work has had controversy, uh, mm -hmm. of course, uh, 
I, I think he really is a seminal thinker and has not yet really had his due. Uh, I mean, in the days when he worked, there were certainly those that were, that were attracted to Reich and, and, mm-hmm. and quite a number of deep thinkers in the 20th century. Uh, yeah. I mean, very prominent thinkers across many, many fields. But uh, the work was extremely controversial based on its findings and basically his orientation. And so when I went to write this book, I I um, had those that told me, you know, well, you might leave his name out. And, oh, uh, my goodness. And, um, and to speak, to just <laughs> speak to the organizational application, you know, because Reich really – wasn't an organizational theorist. He did some very wrote, wrote some very rudimentary things about organizations, but not much. He concentrated on the individual organism as a as a mm-hmm. uh, psychiatrist and a pioneering one. It was second generation after Freud, but mm-hmm. um, uh, and then in his work beginning in the 1930s and 40s and 50s, then until he died, you know, was a lot in natural science, in uh, biology, and 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 Mm -hmm. physics but its application for what an organizational system was that it must be some kind of natural energy system because it's made up of it's composite energy of human animals that are working and and what the nature of sociality was it it had important implications i think for social science and and then for intervention practice and uh so in getting uh, to stay with your question to get it was important for me just to sort of get this out there i mean yeah. i had worked yeah. on it i had been the national practice leader in uh, uh, uh actually in north america for a, you know a very major consulting firm for what was kpmg and then Barron point and then uh deloitte i had mm-hmm. been a, a managing director and partner there and it had a very large practice in organizational change. And um, so I just, I just, after 30 years of this, I wanted to revisit some of the original thinking I had in the, in the graduate at work yeah. years back and yeah. see, see what I made of it. So it was a discovery process for me to come back and look at many. And there are many cases in the book. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, and rather detailed in light of the theory and then come back and revisit the theory. And I, and I should be quick to add that it, there's really two levels of theory. One I, is, is uh, organizational theory per se mm-hmm. as a mini social system. And I appreciate your background as a social scientist, as a sociologist, mm-hmm. of sort of understanding what, are, what, it, what, a, what is a social system at its roots Yes. And then for its theory of practice, so, so for consultants then intervening into systems to try to improve them. And so I thought there was some major uh, things to say here. And as an author, I just wanted to say it. Not, <laughs> And as I said, I had some publishers and, and others, even prominent, you know, why don't you leave Reich's name out and just concentrate on the organizational application? I said, well... <sighs> Because I think that we would miss something important. Oh, not and, just miss yeah, something, you know, uh, miss yeah. a huge. Miss something. the essence. Miss, miss the essence of the argument. Right, and were. this wonderful, uh, refreshing attention to human energy, bioenergy, but human as the sole source, if you will, of the energy impulses that go in and out of social systems uh it it really put the two uh realms together the the individual the energized or de-energized individual depending on the context that the social system provides all the way out to you know as far out as you want to go in those systems that's right but to to put you know we've talked in the jargon in conversations particularly in our field of organization change we talk about energy but we don't talk about where what it is where it comes from yeah, and correct. what it does it's just like there the oh yeah we need the energy but you um caught on in the 80s in your doc, in your master's work you caught on to this 
idea that there is something about the energies that Reich wrote about and, and taught about uh, that uh, would, would, after years of your practice in these very big responsible jobs, it must have been what we'd say in Maine, stuck in your craw. You know, there's something here that I picked up when I started this with Reich. Yeah. And now I really want to, as you said, say it. And uh, uh, we could go way off tangent on why the stigma still exists. But I say it's because we're a bunch of uh, 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 pilgrims who can't, well, pure, pilgrims and Puritans who can't, who can't get over uh, any reference at all to human sexuality, which I suppose uh, put some people off. But you know, otherwise, as you say, there were some great minds who were attracted to Reich and he to them. And the conversations, wouldn't you have loved to have been uh, a third in, in a third chair between him and others as they were really free freewheeling their thinking and, and looking at connections and implications and, and probably jotting down notes in little pads. Uh, because they were growing as they were working, and particularly right. as Reich was working on these theories, uh, well, the exactly. theory and everything under it. So well, it was stuck in your craw. That's where we'll leave it. And now it's out. <laughs> well, and there is something just to be said for having it said, you know, mm -hmm. and that, and that, and, and to do it for the work itself, for the contribution itself. Mm -hmm. a, a couple of things, if I may say, I, uh, and I, I don't know if I mentioned this, David, in our preliminary conversation we had a month ago or so on this. It was um, to the question, uh, you know, for whom do you write the for whom do you write? Yes, as an author. For whom do you write? Mm -hmm. I had I had seen a marvelous uh, documentary about the uh, Native American Indian Indian writer, a Kiowan, uh, uh and Scott Mamaday, who's you know who's up there now in age, mm -hmm. and. Uh, he was asked, and he's a painter, very creative, as well as, a, as a, you know, having won the Pulitzer for his work back in the 60s, mm -hmm. was, was uh, he was asked the question for, you know, for whom do you write? And he said, I can do no better than to cite the essay as William Gass. And he said, Gass was asked that question, for whom do you write? And he says, well, I don't write for myself. That would be selfish. And I really don't write, especially for an audience. He said, that would be pandering. Mm -hmm. I write for the thing trying to be born. Oh. And so that you're in service of there's something that's in you that wants to be said. And I, I believe most creative art, artists and I believe scientists that are that work in very yes. fundamental yes. terms think like that, too. They're really onto an inquiry of what it is yes. uh, that that is trying to get out and that they become it servant in a way. Yeah. Yeah. It's mediating through them. You're you're its instrument. So yeah. uh it would I I uh the book wrote itself actually rather quickly. Uh I can't and believe then, and then there's another, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, there's about eight months and you know that and, is fantastic and, but so then this really was eight, nine your... months in production and rewrites and oh stuff. yeah 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 that's that's kind of toil to do to do all the reviews and revisions but it's oh, yeah. all part of the show so uh but the story I, I the, the story uh, and now that i hear it you're talking about energy your energy as a pra as a practicing uh creative writer author uh it, it, the way it, it flows through you know, your voice comes through without, you know, in the way, right? But the 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 uh, synergy <laughs> that I find in in this piece piece of work called "Out of the Workplace Trap," we can talk about that title. As you say, it, it was eight months, and it came out of you like, uh, <laughs> yeah, after a long gestation period. This was the book that you. I think we're meant to write. Now, we talk about all the after work with copy editing and all the rest. And no, oh, don't touch my baby when someone wants to mm -hmm. turn a sentence into something else. But overall, it's out. And uh, That's right. yeah. And, and so what, what do you think once your book and 
our book, the Peter Vale book and, and mine, and all these others that really are things we have, we, we know they have to be born. You know, we that's know right. that we're the, that's right. Essentially the, the, at least the midwife, if not the, the source of, of it. And uh, once it's out there, it's a little bit of a letdown though, isn't it? You know, it's out. Well, there. that's a saying, isn't it? I mean, mm-hmm. every animal is sad after sexual. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so there is a, because there's this sort of a sheer release. And so it touches all of the emotions that are sort of swirling inside of you. But there is a kind of uh, deep release and deep uh, relaxation that comes from it. And I so appreciate the opportunity to talk about it here on your show is, is um, you know, it's been said. So it's not, I, I, you don't, once it, as it's inside you, before it's born, you are bearing it. And you sort of the energy is concentrating inside before it is released, that itself is a reflection of the way energy moves in the body. Yes. So the, as it concentrates, there is a kind of natural tension that builds up. And unless you can release it, you don't ever get to that sort of feeling of fulfillment. Yeah. And there may be an attempt to try to explain it or over explain it or do this or that when it's like, well, the work's out there. You can come to it or not and read it or not. And come to your come to one's own sense of it but um so uh all of those all those feelings are in play for sure but the second group of who you write for the audience if you will uh are men and women and others who i think have great courage and, and a little bit of maybe fantasy to want to be invited uh to to come through the boundary small b of an organization and be helpful if uh if there's malady helpful if they is on the other end of the spectrum and there's they need a growth burst to be helpful i you know i've been in a lot of conversation now thanks to zoom over the last three years particularly mm-hmm. through peter vale's connections about these people and and you are one of them and still are in a way and you teach people who are going to become them at, when you're teaching in their master's program uh they need they needed what you're what you gave birth to whether they know it or not <laughs> and, but well, if you had any connection with some people who have said marty i i went through this book and you know i think you really are onto something and the next thing i went out next engagement I, I i signed on for it started working in my head energy human energy look at look at flow and it made a difference in the choices i made and what i said and what i didn't say and you know so sure. I, w- what about the practitioner now who's read your book well and Right. And I, I don't need to be glib when I say, you know, not concerned with the audience. Of course, it's a th- about the thing being born, but it's in service of a of a constituency, as it were, just like sure. organizations serve constituencies. And mm-hmm. and uh, so this was really written for uh, practitioners and mm-hmm. for organization scholars that want to understand uh, the roots of an organization. I will will start, if, if I may, on a couple of things. One, the it was it was rather my coming to this was rather rooted in practice and i'll come back to how it even the organizational theory aspect wasn't just let's come up with some interesting ideas right. it was rooted in in the experience of practice at first and then it comes back to it at, at after the sort of reflections of of as ideas start to get put together about based on observations but i'll just start with this if i may david is dave is um uh, and it's something i read uh another thinker i was always very influenced by was uh, martin buber and there was a um something i think that was said in a biography intellectual biography of him that was released a few years ago by a a a, a, a prominent guy uh that cites uh Hannah Arendt's statement that says this, because the book is a book about thought and ideas and concepts yes. and ways of seeing organizations and ways of practicing yes. a theory of organizations and a theory of practice. Mm-hmm. Uh, what Arendt said is this about thought. She says, all thought, strictly speaking, is an afterthought. 
What comes first is experience. And then from the experience, you one reflects. And that goes quite far, even in the roots of what I'm talking about, because I understand organizations and social systems more generally as not just linguistic systems and much of or cognitive systems, because the human animal has cognition, and that's a very important part of the species mm-hmm. for sure. But we're we're still uh, animal organisms where energy is streaming through us that gives rise to thought in a special way for our species. And uh, and so what what the you know not everything is just verbal, and we yeah. know that we know that. Um, little common sense things we say that 80%, I mean, we teach this in first level supervisory classes on communications that most communications, 80%, 90% is the old self, is nonverbal. 90%, Mm -hmm. 80% of communications is nonverbal. And yet here we have an OD and they're all very valuable. I use all of these techniques, some dialogical OD, appreciative inquiry and all, but these are highly sort of linguistic and cognitive kinds of interventions. Yeah. Know yeah. that if we just start from the fundamentals, 80% of it isn't that. And so let me just go to start with what was my experience. And then this afterthought of how I came to Reich mm-hmm. what, about organizations was here I was, you know, beginning doing practice in organizations, living in organizational systems. I was a worked in a, 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 a statewide a commercial bank and and the system, I, they were kind of stuck. And mm-hmm. I hadn't studied a lot of OD, but enough. I was a senior enough level in the system that I had read some OD and it made me eager to read more. And I did graduate work and serious study and I had really good teachers in the field. Uh, but it was like, uh, I felt something was kind of missing Yeah, in, in all of the technique, which was mostly sort of behavioral interventions or cognitive interventions. And, yeah. you know, my experience was what I knew, and I think most practitioners experience who are, have been at it for a time, you will say, you know, unless you're really hitting the emotional ground in an organization where something starts to shift, until then, you're sort of clear in the rubble. You're not yeah. quite at the, the thing. And, and the main observation was, Dave, was that the organizations were stuck. And, uh, you know, at, at, and certainly at their limits, the ones that weren't doing well were were really stuck. And you could even replace people and still the system stuck. still remained stuck. I mean, yeah. Vale understood that and how, you know, culture seemed to transcend just the individuals, even mm-hmm. leaders that you would put in charge. And somehow the system would would stand out. And we know that even in large scale social systems, you can replace the president of the United States. And somehow the character of the institutions remains the same. Yeah. And and so what is it that you need to do? What's going on, I guess, is the question that's asked. That, and that, that led is the me- question. To put together some things because I had studied Reich as a young man and mm-hmm. I was a history major and under and my undergraduate work and and I studied a, a, a good deal of social science and had read Reich on some topics that he re- had written about and I was much impressed with the way he thought about things and and um, uh, so I said gee and then I and then I had my own uh, personal need for therapy in my early 20s. And I I was careful who I chose. I really wanted to work with someone who knew what they were doing yeah. and didn't just throw out ideas. And because, yeah. you know, I, I was dealing with the very difficult emotions that I hadn't resolved when I was young mm-hmm. and and uh, and a difficult family situation I was in and and um, as a young man and uh, couldn't get to until I was in my early 20s. And wow, this guy really was, you know, helped me. I could breathe again. I could work again. My whole level of functioning, I I was really moved. This guy knew what he was doing. He was trained by Reich. uh, It actually testified, and people know Reich's history, was the one physician who testified at Reich's trial. This guy was just new. He was good. They weren't just a jumble of ideas. He was it worked. worked. It worked. He was working with what I would characterize as knowledge. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. And it's not like he knew everything, but he knew where to go to help me, yeah. where to go and working with my body and how the how the I was stuck. Yeah. How I was stuck. And that that so I looked at how could I apply was there something comparable in the field of OD? I was sort of thrashing about for a thesis topic. You would mm-hmm. know that as a teacher. Oh, yeah. And, and I saw some things in Reich, and then I thought, well, there's some grander themes that Reich was talking about, and could I apply that? And I had a really great uh, teacher at Pepperdine who ran the MSOD program, Walt Ross. Yeah. Walt was very open to it. I mean, yeah. there were others there that weren't as open to yeah. it. But he said, you know, go for it. And then I studied concurrently with a college of psychiatrists that were still practicing his modality back in Jersey. I lived in Los Angeles, so I flew back and forth once a month. You really worked. And I was the only sort of, as a social science guy, I wasn't training as a therapist. Yeah. Most of them all were physicians because it was a somatic therapy and Reich was careful that, you know, they mostly be physicians that were practicing this work Mm -hmm. is to not miss more serious uh, disorder that because mm-hmm. things were happening in the body. So uh, anyway, so as I d- did that, I started to apply it and wondered, well, organizations are not uh, animals because they don't have skins, but they no. are, they do represent a composite of human energy streaming together in service of a function that the organization is born to perform. Sometimes, right. sometimes, that's commonly discussed in the literature as purpose. Yeah. It's actually, as I thought about it, even as I wrote this book, I got more clear than I was even 30 years ago when I did my grad thesis. And it was published serial, serially in a technical journal at the time uh, through the American College of Ergonomy was, was uh, that, that the system itself was getting stuck. It wasn't an animal, but it, it developed boundary between inner and outer. I mean, mm-hmm. Lewin helped us understand that, for example, mm-hmm. that was operating in a field. There mm-hmm. was a field of energy operating. And I said, well, what if I sort of systematically applied this and began to understand it? So what began maybe as, well, that's an interesting idea. That's an afterthought from my experience. The organization is stuck. I had the experience of working individually with a therapy where I got unstuck. Was there mm-hmm. something comparable? And so I started to that could be applied in the organizational systems level. And what implications would that have for where and how one intervenes? And so I just started to put those together. And it was like, wow, this is a real energy that people go to work at. And and because uh, people you can feel when you get your work done in a way gratified. I just I know. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You know. It's and when you're stuck, you're frustrated. I, like I, you, know, you can be stuck either for internal reasons or external things that are imposing yeah. on you. So I began to think about that and apply the classic organizational literature, all which was very good in sociodynamics, Ed Shine's work, Lewin's, oh, yeah. Chris, others that were all very good, but something seemed missing. Yeah. And that missing, I think you had alluded to it earlier before, was there's this primal energy of work that in a social system manifest, you know, can get stuck and that the work doesn't result in the system being uh, as as productive as it can be or as innovative as it can be and what it's aiming to be, what it was born or conceived to be, and that people remain unfulfilled. And I was unfulfilled as a practitioner. It's like I'm I'm scratching at the edges. I'm not helping them really get to... And that was certainly replete in the field, Dave, right? People talk oh, about yeah. organization. Very frustrated. Yeah. Very it's like what is being transformed? It is the energy yeah. streaming in the system. Even today, people talk about systemic systems, et cetera, et cetera. And it's like, well, what is it that is moving in the system? That's right. And that's what Reich helps us with. I like the uh, something, uh, and he and it, be, it went beyond metaphor that there's something yeah. streaming in the organism that as we come together, that's the nature of sociality is how we trying to achieve some things together that we can either be fulfilled in and feel fulfilled or our customers or those in the field that we serve will feel fulfilled or the product is fulfilled. Like, like you know, in a supply chain, it's fulfilled. It, you name it. There's fulfillment. and and. Uh, so 
All right. Well, I've maybe spoken enough there, but no, I think no, that's I, quite I, different. Your, your enthusiasm is, is 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 certainly expected, uh, Marty, because you are, you are onto something. But you you uh, you use the, the 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 term work energy, uh, you know, throughout the book, and that really caught caught my my attention because I have Peter Vale and then I together have studied what practice is and what what practice is is a level of work it's a level of work whether it's for fun or profit right. that rises above i guess what we'd call ordinary effort uh because if a person a person an individual likes the feedback a lot about achieving results that initially look like writing this book you know, beyond their reach. And then they achieve them and there's gratification and there's growth and development because that is where the learning occurs. And and so when you are bottling up work energy from the way you've written about it structurally or through personalities, toxics, whatever the the cause, you are doing two things. One, you're you're diminishing whatever the results of the work can be at an ordinary level. But you're also blocking someone from excelling. And I think well, that's right. I think, you know, I've been studying excellence for forever. But when someone goes from uh do it well to excelling, uh that really gives them a feeling of what potential is as an individual. So why would I want to take my work energy to uh uh work with others who do don't care that I excel? And because I care that they excel. So it becomes sort of a uh, a wonderful uh, way that we who prepare students, for example, can show them that what they carry within them and they take out there as soon as an enthusiasm really develops for something that they want to do at the excellence level, life changes, there's transformation. Now, if you can put a bunch of people together who are excelling, like a really great sports team, uh, high performing teams that Peter Vale studied back in the 80s and 90s, now you've got something we all want to watch and admire. So I feel you're, you are showing us, you're opening up the lid, the lid, if you will, and you're showing us inside and you're showing it's the work energies that Reich helped you understand and directly experience through his uh, surrogates and, and Wow, wouldn't it be terrific if we who consult could go in and open up more, <laughs> you know, like the like the service guy who came to do my cable today. He he found three or four pinch points where the signal was just rotten and I'm paying for a full signal and I'm getting less. So when you come into an organization well, and go, right. hey, here's a pinch point. There's a pinch point. Open it up. People must go, wow. Well, that, the magic is in your work where, where, where it can be full, or so the, the, the streaming of the energy. And, yeah, and it, work it, is work. It, yeah. It's the composite energy of people moving together around a function, mm-hmm. like a bank, it's to facilitate the flow of commerce, or mm-hmm. in a hospital, it's for community medical service. There's a function it's trying to fulfill. And if that energy, because developmentally gets disturbed or uh, gets turned back, uh just like in a body the the the, the energy the household of the energy Reich spoke about it gets mm. pinched or uh, turned back or armored up it it can't get the the excelling is it's not fully discharged mm-hmm. it can't fully concentrate and flow and move it doesn't stream quite properly and then it it it's not circulating properly it gets plugged up and that that then gives rise to the various behavioral and structural symptoms we see right. in organizations. That, so that sort of principle became sort of obvious to me. And then it becomes, and then it pinches it per, in particular ways in mm-hmm. the structure of the system. So like Reich understood that was happening in the body, there could be over concentration of energy in the head, it can be overly in the chest, it doesn't inspire properly, it can mm-hmm. be lower in the body or in the pelvis, it doesn't stream properly, so isn't discharged. It gets all fouled up. And then yep. that gives rise to, I mean, he was a student of Freud, so he understood that. 
when that energy gets blocked, it comes out in dysfunctional ways. And then that's what people in symptoms, social or structural in an organizational sense. And that's what people tend to attend to piecemeal, but something more fundamental is not being attended to. And that's what I thought is, for me, that's what is the, you know, distinctive contribution of this thinking in it, uh, for organizational sy- systems. It is because your subtitle is Theory and Therapy of Organizations Based on the Work of Wilhelm Reich. And uh, I thought, now there's there's a very interesting choice, uh, Marty, the word therapy, because, you know, uh, that we we the connotation is, you know, one and one and sitting in a chair or on lying on the couch. But I like, I like the sound of it for organization uh, assistance, because in a way they need a therapy to find where those energy blockages right. are. And, and so that was your intention then to call it a therapy. There's still are large scale human systems. And so organizations are not strictly mechanical systems. Much no. of the literature treats it that way. Even yes. Captain Khan and others, they treat Input, it as throughput, inputs output. and outputs. <laughs> and that is not the action of, of organisms that are streaming together, even though organizations aren't animals. They don't have a membrane mm-hmm. that, def- that defines an animal is a membrane that exists in the way the energy is moving inside of it. But organizations do form boundaries. They form what are classically called cultures that mediate in and out. But again, even the classical literature is besides the scattered references that you mentioned to energy are not really put together about what is it? How does it move? How does it block? How does it stream together? What happens when it turns over on itself, remains stuck in a system? And then that stasis fuels the difficulties. Yeah. And then we're then we're sort of contending with that. But yeah, that's why I found many of the of, of, of approaches to culture or systems thinking, they're rather heady. One doesn't one yeah. can't quite do much with them yeah. because you're not at the level of what people are experiencing and how it's either yeah. stuck or not. And I, I worked in large system, billion dollar systems that were stuck. One died in file chapter 11. I oh, my God. In the book. <laughs> died I mean, on the table. Huh? That's a pathology in the system. It's, I remember reading it, about it, that it, one. It, yeah. huh? I remember reading about that. Yeah, I, I mean, it died. The organization died. And, and, and thousands of people lost their livelihoods and customers weren't served. No, and so we, there, the, these weren't just metaphors of like people. They really had they really had loss they were dealing with. So how could we d- develop effective means? Now, that doesn't mean I go around with clients and talk organization therapy or with my students or tell mm-hmm. them that's the language to use. You 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 meet the client wherever they are. But it's to know that at a fundamental level, we're somehow mobilizing the energy in the system so it is not stuck where yeah. we intervene we look for those pinch points as you say yep. yep and we observe them and we can't just smuggle in theories or diagnostics we yep. have to sort of meet this, observe. this is what Carefully i see we have to be clear ourselves right yeah you know i mean we have to be open to really yep. read it but if we're stuck with a bunch of ideas that it's only this or that or its system of relationships, that's where most OD leaves things today. And an organization yeah. is a system of relationships. That's not enough. No, it's the no. way the relationships move with regard to their constituted functions. Or do they either flow and get properly concentrated and discharged, or do they get stuck? Now you're onto something if you can speak of it in that level of specificity. So I, you know, so to come to your first question, I was interested in writing a book that got to that, that just said it. Yes. And not was sort of for what for me as a practitioner was, you know, close, but not close enough. I mean, in what was available in the classical literature. Yeah. Wow. I, I have to say, I'm, I have to say I have a time budget for these. Sure, and, sure. And then and, and this, maybe we got to go to. Uh, a conversation uh, 2.3 because this has been delightful, but I, I just want to kind of hold this moment as we're closing off this particular conversation with um, an observation of your energy. 
uh, it's it, it, the listener is gonna gonna hear it. They're gonna hear it and what you say, how you say it, but the um, the force of your energy. And uh, so my question, as we're wrapping up, is where are you directing your energies now in the short term? You mentioned earlier, maybe another book, uh, a video, a podcast, because you gotta, you've got to let this energy flow. Well, I, <laughs> the Martin well, Goldberg again, energy very, must flow. <laughs> I'm very appreciative of, of getting it out there in the podcast. I'm looking at you doing yet an, a, another podcast that's good. And then looking at some placements in some uh, organizational DOD like journals uh, uh, to, to get it out there. And then I'll, I'll do some speaking. I'm all, I also teach a, uh, seminar for it's only a half a dozen people, uh, that are OD practitioners that have been at it for a while and that are, that are drawn to this, uh, uh, method of thinking mm-hmm. and, uh, and it doesn't take away anything from their own personal. No, energy. that's a cool they thing. They have to bring all of the. I mean, the methodology is a. Yeah. These are heuristics, and they are ideas. They're only there to kind of help us move. But I do b- believe this gives us some additional knowledge. My, oh, yeah. I'm drawn to go to those places where I can feel my own energy, and I feel. And at the at its core, there's an excitement. So you're, yes, picking up that, and where that yeah. where that energy can move and not be. Blocked. frustrated where you experience oh, don't it. use reich's name i mean that must have been a real buzz killer you know when you heard that from some i heard it from number chick, of people. Chick, and, and friends, people who meant well oh yeah oh, it, no, you know, know. oh yeah we got to be careful here. Huh? Like, well, how the hell do you think his name has been silenced uh, <laughs> i know i i you know as, as we knew when we first discovered each other in the first conversation i I uh, spent a, a good chunk of my career up in Western Maine, very near Rangeley, where Reich uh, uh, spent a lot of his I mean, time. Where his laboratory was there. In his the, laboratory. The, and yeah. uh, I I used to hear, oh, the Reich, you know, and then, oh, Reich. So, but I met his daughter uh, several times who came down to my little campus and and uh, she sounded like you. Uh, she sounded like Energy is energy, folks. It's biological. It's there. You can deny it or you can you can uh, accept it and then work it. Uh, and, you know, I'm sure she was a lot more uh, scholarly in that in that way of saying it. But basically that. Yeah, she was, was a physician a, herself. Ava yeah, Wright. she 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 is. And you know, she, I don't know if she passed away, but I think the the. Your last point of saying, I like to go where I can bring my enthusiasm, where I can be with people who are at least open to to uh, uh, some ideas and would like to have some interchange. Because in my view, Martin, it you're not taking away from anyone else's stuff when you say, you're not saying replace everything you mm-hmm. are working with, your models, your assumptions with this. It's it, and a lot of people do that. I want to force in another, still another uh, theory of a of, of practice. And what you're saying is, it's already there. Everything else you want to use, use use your whole uh, bag of tricks, have them available. But do think of yourself in the presence of people as someone who's carefully, carefully observing what's going on. That's right. And what isn't, and why. No, that's exa- that's exactly. Right. Uh, so it ends in it en- as it starts. It ends in practice. What what am I doing that is practical that helps move people out in a way where they are more fulfilled in their work and the work is of a higher quality nature, uh, less compromise. And I believe this can also help systems that are not just strictly to trying to be great or grand or even excel. That it can help even with modest changes because right. we're dealing more objectively with the rudiments of what's going right. on so they can keep on serving customers that's right. or other purposes that's right a lot of people would be very happy with keeping on <laughs> you know let alone being the best and the best but that's right uh, there's always the prospect of the of better which that's i right. think i think is what you know brings the practice energies up and it, I, I keep looking at my god my money over this is wonderful and i cannot thank you enough for, your for devoting this hour to helping us understand folks the book is called out of the workplace trap theory and therapy of organizations based on the work of 
Wilhelm Reich, and I'm going to add a, another line and Martin Goldberg, <laughs> based on the work of Martin Goldberg, because you've, you've done, you're doing the work now that he started, and I think you're going to keep doing it until at least you're my age, which is 80. Do you think? Are you going to slow down after no, 80? No, I mean, it's, you know, I mean, you just keep going on. My dad, my dad worked well into his 90s. So there you go. You know, so please do keep it going. And I'm looking forward to your, well, to your next you book. and I'll talk some more with her. Definitely. I promise. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening to the practice podcast, where we discuss practice with a capital P. If you'd like to hear more, listen in on Spotify, Automatic. Apple Podcasts or go to inactionresearch.com slash podcast dash page. And if you'd like to learn more about social inaction and the nature of practice, head over to inactionresearch.com for more information. Thank you for supporting this show. We look forward to hearing from you soon. Oh, and, and one more thing. How could I forget? The book on practice as a way of being is available now in digital form, something that would be new, like podcasting to many of us. And it's a, a great way of learning more and more about what this podcast presented when Peter Vale and I originated it several years ago. So please come to www.mylibrary, one word, dot world, slash practice, and you'll see what I mean. Thank you.